Well, good morning and welcome. Welcome any visitors. We're always grateful to have you here at Southside Bible Church to come as brothers and sisters in Christ. Some of you we just met, we already love each other because of Jesus Christ. What a privilege to come and worship. And I want you now, we're going to continue to worship through the Word of God. We're studying through uh, Peter's first epistle, if you will turn there. We're in chapter 3. Uh, that's where I'll be preaching from this morning. I pray that you're taking it to heart. This book is rich and that some of you are memorizing it. And I pray that you're learning how to pray over Scripture and to keep again and again praying these things into your life, seeking the grace of God to live gracious and submissive in a world that hates you, your aliens, your aliens and sojourners. This is not our homeland. And so that many will glorify God on the day of their visitation because of your excellent behavior. So I want us as a church to live those kind of lives. I'll never be happy with just gathering and doing the things that we are supposed to do. I want to draw from the power that is available to us by the Spirit of God through the means of grace to live the transformed lives that Peter is writing about. We are not called to powerless lives and just attach sound doctrine to them. We're not to have a form of godliness and deny its power. We want the lives that Peter is calling the saints of God to in this letter. It is how God gets glory. I pray that you have those who you are salt and light to right now. I pray that you've had some come to faith by your excellent life. If all you have is wounded victims along your faithful path, you've been unfaithful. And if all you have is people who love and adore you for your goodness, you've been unfaithful along the way. We're praying to have this beautiful balance that Peter is teaching. So may God grant to Southside many with this beautiful life that is being described in Peter's first epistle because it is so counter-cultural. Humility and submission to God and His authorities Quietly bearing wrongs with a love that never fails is the means that God uses to save this world through the gospel of Jesus Christ. So this is how the kingdom is advanced. There's no shortcuts. And so I want to pray this morning for us as a church that we're getting this and God will uh, make us a church full of people like this for his name's sake, that he would get all the glory. So let's gather and come with our hearts now and pray these very things. Father, I thank you for the Apostle Peter. I thank you, inspired by your Holy Spirit, we have this letter. Lord, I thank you for the things we're learning. They're very appropriate to our time and to our lives. And so I pray this morning as we open up again this epistle that you will teach us, that your Spirit would illuminate these words. I pray this morning uh, for wives as we continue in 1 Peter 3, God, I pray that you administer this word to their hearts. Lord, we pray for conformity to Christ and to your will. And so, Lord, let every heart now be open and submissive to the word of God. Let no one fight these words. If they are your words, they are good and true. And so I pray, God, minister to our church here this morning. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. Well, this morning, I hope to go over 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Uh, Peter's teaching us in here about how women are to deal with an unsaved husband, or he says, one who is disobedient to the Word of God. And then next week, we're going to look at verse 7 of how husbands then are to deal with their wives. And so I, I pray that uh, singles uh, will really take this to heart and learn some excellent principles in here, husbands and wives that... God will do some beautiful things in our midst. And just even in counseling, if you're not in any of those roles, a husband or wife or, or a single, no matter what, that, that you'll, you'll learn the principles of this text because they're, they're beautiful. Uh, one of the hardest things I've watched or counseled since becoming a pastor is encouraging wives how to live with an unsaved husband who's mistreating them and being disobedient to the Word of God, it just, it rips at my heart because I love my wife so much. I treasure her and I want us as men to treasure our wives, how we treat them and care for them and how we nurture them to help them grow into godliness God cares about greatly. 
To see a wife mistreated and unloved and uncared for strikes at my heart so deeply. And it strikes at my flesh to watch it as well. But God has a better and more effectual way for us to deal with these situations than fleshly. In this passage, he's going to give us one that's excellent. He's going to give us one that is pleasing to him. In verse 4, he says, wives, if you do this, this is precious in the sight of God. It's precious in God's sight. Doesn't that just kind of make your heart rejoice? Ladies, there's something that you can do on this earth that is precious in the sight of God. That's not small. That's big. I hope every one of you are saying, yeah, I, I want to live in such a way that it's precious to my God. So before we drill down into the details of this passage, I thought I'd begin kind of with like, like a bird's eye observation of the text that might be critical in helping us understand it fully. First, just kind of a general observation. In Ephesians 5, when Paul gives the role of husbands and wives for Christians, he gives three verses to the wife on submission and respect, and he gives the husband nine verses on love. You know, a third more, uh, and I'm saying why. You know, that seems kind of out of balance. And, and I've said this before, I think the problem at most weddings is that the couple are in love with the same man as they stand on the altar. <laughs> <coughs> so I think Paul had to spend three more times, men love your wives. Man is the leader in love, and the wife is a responder in submission to that love and leadership. But now we come to 1 Peter 3, and there's six verses to the wife, and there's one for the poor husband. It flips. Why? I think for the very reason why it is hard to let anyone date my daughters. <laughs> Just stay away, guys. <laughs> I had one slip through this week, and it bothered me. I think the reason I struggle with it, there's a lot of reasons, but it's, I think it's harder to submit to an authority that does not have your best interest, but only his. And that is not to say it's not really hard to love a woman who's unsaved as a husband, but submission to an unsaved spouse is one of the toughest places you can find yourself you know, as a woman. And I think that's part of what grabs at my heart with my daughters. And, and, the, and my daughters in this church, the sisters. And so I want you to know this as I unfold this text. If you're a wife who finds yourself in this place this morning, I have so much compassion, just so much compassion for what you're facing. But this morning, I want to give you wings to the beauty of what God is calling you to in this passage. I know everything that I'm about to say is completely opposite of everything that our culture teaches, believes, or preaches. But this is one of my hermeneutics. I call it a checking principle. The kingdom of God is the complete reverse of the kingdom of this world. So anything that we teach from the Word of God should be opposite of this world, so check this morning. We're on track. Second, I want you to drop this passage, uh, this, I'm going to call it a diamond, in, in its context, <coughs> let's, let's let God do His work in our hearts this morning. This is for everyone. The principles in this passage have struck a heart, a chord in my heart and have done surgery. And so even as men this morning, there's going to be some excellent things for you to learn. But if you'll flip back to just 1 Peter 2, 11 through 12, it was kind of our foundation verses of this section that we're in. He said, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts, which wage war against your soul. Keep, so that's the internal battles. And now the external is keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles so the thing in which they slander you as evildoers. They're going to slander you for your excellent behavior. They may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. The day that they get saved, they're going to praise God because of your excellent behavior and how you loved them when they were unruly and awful and terrible to you. Your testimony will be salt to lead them to Christ. So in this section, Peter is fleshing out how to live then as aliens in a very hostile world, how to be in the world in it but not of it, how to be a citizen of the United States of America while our true citizenship is in heaven. 
how to live in this world and to reach it for Jesus Christ. How, how do we win this world to Christ? And Peter says, our lives must be in submission to Christ, which encourages me that we can grow in this because who do you think battled with submission more than anyone was Peter. And we began this epistle showing you how much he fought the will of God and he would end up going to a cross and be crucified upside down by a government for the name of Jesus Christ. Peter learned what he's preaching to us. And so you can learn it. If you struggle with this and it's been a lifetime battle, there is victory in Jesus. Government, submit. Workplace with your masters and servants, submit with all respect. Family now, we come into this realm, submit to your partner. And then live in an understanding way, men. And we'll come to the church and he'll say, submit to one another in our, our next section. Peter sees submission then as the key to living faithful in a foreign country. The key to living faithful in this land, he's saying, is you need to understand submission. Uh, the, the same way we're going to go into trials and fiery ordeals that come upon you, he's going to say you need to live in submission to God's hand that he brought them and he's working in your life. And then he's going to say we need to be submissive to shepherds and to the flock. Submission is to entrust your soul to a faithful creator in doing what is right. So Peter sees that as the testimony we're going to be is when we surrender our lives to God and we live in accordance to his will and reflect who he is to this world. That's when the gospel breaks out. And that's what he's saying is our key. So this morning now we're going to move into the sphere of a home. And, and next week, we'll stay in the home where we're going to work out this loving and submissive spirit to God. And so let's step now into the family. Look with me then in 1 Peter 3, verse 1. <clears throat> in the same way, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives. So first, just in the same way. This is a very important phrase to understanding, interpreting this passage. It's connected to the point that Peter has been working out. He's not done with his argument. He's bringing the same attitude and spirit that we're to have to a government and to our bosses right into our homes, wives with a husband. He's going to bring the same principles, everything he's talking about now, right into the home. What were the last verses we looked at? In chapter 2. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you were healed. You were continually straying like sheep, but now you've returned to the good shepherd and the guardian of your souls. So we, we looked at our example of Jesus Christ of submission <coughs> to unruly government. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. What? That we might die to sin and live to righteousness. We've returned to the guardian and the shepherd of our souls, the good shepherd, which is the key to living these principles out. And to this morning, how not to be afraid, even in the shadow of the valley of death or a difficult husband. He's going to teach us how not to fear. And so, ladies, if you are in this situation this morning, the first message to you is you have power from on high to live countercultural and respond godly to such behavior by your husband. There is a way to live righteously and not sinfully in this setting and in this condition because this is a setting that brings out a lot of rebellion and a lot of sin. And he's going to teach us how do you do this, ladies? And he's going to say, It's the cross. The cross. Live at it. Every time your flesh says, Enough. Enough, I'm out of here. I want to go back to my parents' house. I want to get out of this. I'm done. I'm finished. And every time your flesh says that, that, that anything has to be better than this marriage, I am so unloved in this house and not cared for. I'm out of here. Look at the cross. Come again to the cross. There is a power to obey God and live to righteousness in this realm and in this sphere. Do you think it was easy to hang on a cross and bear the wrath of God for what would take us forever to bear on that cross? Do you think that was easy? There's an example in Jesus Christ, and there's a power in Jesus Christ to do this. So in the same way, in the same way, let that give 
wings to your hearts, any ladies in this condition. And I want you to look at the command then in verse 1. You wives, be submissive to your own husbands. So this is addressed to wives. The command is to be submissive. We looked at it. Hupotasso, it's a military term. It meant to rank under, to come under his headship and to come under it willfully. It's not your husband's role to, to make you submissive. It's yours before God. You come under him because you're submitting to Jesus Christ who has put that husband, these authorities that we're learning over you. And so he wants you to be submissive to these husbands because it's unto Christ. And he says something, he says, be submissive to your own husbands. It's interesting, every time in the New Testament where this command is given to a woman, in Ephesians 5, Colossians, and Titus, every time it says, own husbands. It never just says husbands. And so it's very important. It's, it's, a, it's a unique submission that belongs to your husband alone. And so you come under your husband, hupotasso, unto Christ uh, there, there's a oneness that happens in Genesis uh, when, at, at, the, at the altar when you get married, and now you come under this man's headship. This is not that you are inferior in intelligence. It does not mean you're inferior in spirituality, and it does not mean you're inferior in giftedness. That is not what this is saying. It is a role that has been designed by God to put on display to the world Jesus Christ and His bride. And so Christ is the head, and we're his bride in submission to Christ. So it matters. It matters because the gospel of Jesus Christ is at stake. And that's why I reject any other forms of marriage with a husband and a husband or a wife and a wife or any of the other things in our culture. I reject them, and they matter because the gospel of Jesus Christ is at stake. It's not small. And say, why does someone get upset about that? I don't get upset. I hold the truth. There's a marriage. There's a marriage between a man and a wife that puts that display on the way Jesus Christ loves his bride. That is God's design. That's why he made marriage. That's what he's looking out of marriage is to be a reflection of a greater reality that's going to come at the marriage supper of the Lamb one day. Marriage, the husband is the head, and the wife is submissive to that leadership, to that loving leadership. And in that structure, when a husband loves his wife and his wife respects and submits, uh, beauty comes out. As a pastor, uh, it's amazing. Uh, the gospel comes out. And it's a big deal that the gospel of Jesus Christ is put on display through our marriages. And so we, we hold to that. We love that. So that's the command of God, is wives to be submissive to your husbands. My next point is, though, there's a problem here in our text. He says in verse 1, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the Word, these are husbands, they're, they're not being a loving leader, they're not obeying the Word of God. And so I think that this is talking about unbelieving husbands, and I want to share my reasons why from this text, because it's important. Uh, the, it's, it's what's called a first condition in the Greek. So you would say, since uh, they are disobedient to the Word. So it's, it's presumed that this is what they are, this is what they're doing. They're disobedient to the Word. This phraseology is used by Peter in this epistle for salvation. He uses it in 1 Peter 1.22. He said, since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. You have obeyed the truth. You have been saved. You've submitted to this gospel, and you've obeyed the truth of believe in Jesus and be saved. And then in 1 Peter 4, 17, he says, it's time for judgment to begin with the household of God, and if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? They have rejected the gospel. They have not obeyed it. They've disobeyed God's command in the gospel. And then I come to the context. The government was to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Our masters had scoliosis was the Greek word. They're unreasonable and you're suffering unjustly. Jesus was put up on a cross in verses 24 and 25 and they hated him and they killed him. They were unbelievers. And he says, in the same way. So for the purpose, he says in verse 1, why? That they might be one without a word. 
One from being disobedient, so it could be a husband who's struggling, he's in sin, he's battling, and this is a way to win him to start obeying, or it could be to win him from being unsaved, and, and that is the whole flow of what this section has been, so I, I take this to be, this is an unbelieving husband. So my conclusion is that these are great and true principles for how to win a believing husband as well. These principles will work very effectually and effectively if you have a husband who's a believer and he's disobeying the Word of God. So they're they're good principles. But what Peter has in mind here is an unbelieving husband. That's my final answer. But many men sit in the church of God who name the name of Jesus Christ who have not been born again. And so this would be addressing them as well, those who uh, are just characterized as being disobedient to the word, they profess, but there's nothing about their life being transformed and changed by the new birth. And so this is how you would win a husband who is in that place. So it's not just I outright reject Jesus. You could be saying I love him as an unbeliever, and here's what a wife is being directed for how to live with a man like that, and I bet we have a lot more of that here this morning than the other, though I know we have both. So how does a wife seek to win her unbelieving husband to Christ? That's been our whole context, so that they might glorify God on the day of their visitation by the excellent behavior. That's salvation. Here it is again, that your husband might get saved. A wife, my prayer is one day that that gnarly dude would bow to Jesus Christ and say it was my wife who just kept loving me And the way she quietly and gently put Christ on display to me, that is how I was born again. How did they do it in the previous examples? Not by fighting the government. Not by fighting them to show them that they're wrong, but by submission. How did they do it by bosses? Not by being obnoxious and rude, but by patiently enduring it. Now, husbands who are disobedient to the word, you win him not by fighting and showing him where he's wrong, not arguing on every issue, not nagging him, not being a dripping faucet. That is not the means that God has given to you, ladies, in this condition. You don't start putting verses on his beer can. You don't go to his radio station and put it on Caleb so when he turns on the car, he hears it. Just, that isn't it. How do I win him? How do I win him? And I I just, I want you ladies, I say this in such sincerity. I've counseled so many who have tried the other. And I just asked them, did it work? No, it's made him more angry against me. Would you be willing to learn what God says you're to do? The effectual way that God has given. And that's what I want to look at. Is God's way, he says you win him, how? By the behavior of of their wives. The instrument that God uses, hear this, is not your words. Don't miss this. Is Peter saying a wife can't talk to her husband? I've heard that. Oh, this says a wife can never talk to her husband. That is just wrong. You can share with him. You could tell him your testimony. You can have companionship. This is not a call to never talk. That will miss the whole passage. They are one. They're not one without the word. We hear what he said in 1 Peter 1, the word is how you're born again. So they're not one without the word, but they are being one without a word by their wives in this this setting. This is saying it's more important what you are than what you say. This is a call to quit trying to save your husband by your reasoned arguments, to change him by your logic. This is saved without harassment. This is a call to behavior. Excellent behavior back to 2.12 so that they'll glorify God by your excellent behavior. This is a call, ladies, to excellence, to show that you've been born again by a life that silences the critics, not by the perfection, but by the direction of your lives. No one will ever do this perfect. Uh, We'll look at that at the end. There's a gospel for those who have failed in this area. There's a certain kind of behavior, though, that God uses to win unsaved husbands. And Peter is going to love you ladies in this situation by fleshing out what then does this behavior look like? I like that word behavior, but what kind of behavior 
And I think it's very safe to say as we look at this behavior, it's qualities of all women uh, who want to exemplify a godly life. And so what behavior should your husband see uh, and not hear? It says that they might observe. They're watching you day in and day out of the transformation that God is doing in your life. They're watching. So look with me in verse 2. Here's the behavior. They observe then your chaste and respectful <coughs> behavior. The word chaste means pure. It means faithful, not flirting and trying to find another husband. It's a, a chastity, a chasteness. And it's a respectful behavior, and the respectful behavior is toward him. It's, it's not just I'm respectful to everyone else. I'm respectful to my husband. He's the man that God has chosen for your husband to protect you by his power through faith. I'm going back to 1 Peter 1, 5. He says that you are protected by the power of God for this inheritance. How does God protect you? He says, through faith. And he has a faith that he's given you, and he says in the next verse, I'm going to put it in the furnace, and I'm going to boil off impurities so that you'll become this approved faith that will grow, and though you don't see Jesus, you love him. That's the kind of faith that's going to come out. And so here's your furnace. Your furnace is a man who's disobedient to the Word of God. And you've been put into that furnace. And this is going to do more to grow and refine your faith than the nice, sweet, good husband. You're going to grow like crazy having to live in this day by day. And I do have compassion for you living in this day by day. You treat him with respect, not letting him know he's lesser because he's not a Christian and you're a, you're a nothing. I have no respect for who you are and what you say or do, so don't even talk to me. That is not going to get this done. How hard and how important to have a respectful spirit for an unbelieving husband because he is God's choice for you. God, when you stood on that altar and said, I do, that was God's choice for you. Show him respect because God chose him. It didn't say because your husband's respectful, because God is the one who picked him. You show him respect because you respect the God who knew what you needed to be sanctified and to protect your faith and grow it so that you'll make it to the very end for the inheritance that God has called to give you. You know what this is saying? God isn't just going to make you happy. He's going to make you holy and he's going to conform you and, and make sure that you make it to the very end in faith and receive the inheritance and the reward. This is countercultural. This is the opposite of everything our world's saying. Look at the cross. You, you can't do this without a cross. There's another thing that's important to God and Peter, and that is what touches, it touches on being a godly woman, and it's countercultural. It focuses on the externals, Instead of the internals is what our world says, where true beauty is to be found. Our world just says the externals is what makes a woman beautiful. And God is going to rip the rug out from that right now and say, actually, what makes a woman beautiful is the internals. What does our world tell us? By our magazines and our models and our actresses and our singers. Young girls, I just want you to hear that. They, they lie and they say the external is all that matters. If you don't have that, then you have nothing. I want to die. To spend all of your days on that. You're going to, gravity and time and decay win every time. <laughs> and you can throw everything you have against it, all of technology. You can go to the gyms and the malls and clothing stores and jewelry and lotions and Botox and implants and images, everything, and it's not. God's image, reflecting His image is everything. Peter, by the Holy Spirit, rips this apart. Your physical appearance is not what is going to win you a husband, a godly husband. Your body is not why he's looking at pornography. It's because of his sinful heart. There's something else that God says is my means to win this heart. The beauty of the internal working its way to the outside to excellent behavior. It's that whole metamorphosis. The gospel is from the inside that we sang it to the out. From the inside out, God changed me from internal to the outward. Just let this beautiful new spirit, new heart, just radiate and become more and more external in my life. It's a metamorphosis. 
abiding with Christ and you will bear much fruit. There's something that makes a woman more beautiful than the finest of hair products, the best jewelry, the best clothes, and the best technology. And we've got them by the droves here at Southside Bible Church. Older women, discipling the younger women what true beauty is. You young ladies need to learn what real beauty is. And we've got older ladies who figured it out. And you guys got to get together and start helping and teaching what is true beauty. So many today in the church, they're buying the lies of this world. The body beautiful is everything. I hate it. And shame on you if you're teaching it to anyone. If that's what you're modeling and teaching the younger girls. And men teaching them that that's what is beautiful. Shame on you men if you're teaching Ladies, that that's what's beautiful. There's just a million things wrong with this culture and its pornography and its sexuality. That's for another sermon. Maybe next week. Look with me in verse 3. Your adornment then, it must not be, and catch the word, merely external, braiding the hair and wearing gold or jewelry or putting on dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit which is precious in the sight of God. You can't let your adornment be merely external. And so catch that. Merely is not a call to be just frumpy and give up and say, see, Paul says it doesn't matter. That isn't what he said. That is not what he said. This is not a call to never dress up. You can't braid your hair. You can't wear jewelry. You can't wear clothes. That, that, you, you, that, do you see the logic of that argument? I'm not supposed to put gold on. Well, I'm not supposed to put on clothes. That isn't what he's saying. But he's saying, do not think that beauty is that stuff. Do not fall into that lie. This is a call to making that the most important thing in your life, that sought-after quality. All I care about is external. You'll spend a lifetime on that, and one day we're going to gather around your casket, and there's going to be a shell that's going to go in the ground and decay and say, why did I spend all my time on a corpse that's going to decay in the ground when there's a soul that's going to live forever? Spend most of your time on that. Which is what? Well, it's verse 4. It's the hidden person of the heart of a quiet and gentle spirit. So let it be the hidden person of your heart. And I just want you to hear that, the hidden person. You're a person, not just a body. Did you hear that, men? They're a person, not just a body. They're an image bearer of God. Ladies, put the hours in on that. Put the hours in on your person on your heart and your character and your Christ-likeness. Single ladies, you know what, what that'll draw? The ones who it should. Put your time in on that. This is a call to give the most energy to your inner person, not to ignore the outer. This is not a call to just ignore that and throw it away. That is not it. But it is to put your main time on this. So just, how you doing, ladies? How are you doing? How's your balance between the external and the internal? If we watched your life last week, would the way you spent it reveal which one is your treasure? What would would be shown? All the hours at the gym and all the laboring of the diets and everything, all the two hours worth of makeup, what, what would it show in five minutes in the Word of God? This is a call to be women who who know their God and are being changed into His image. The imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit. The other will perish. This is imperishable. And this quality is from God. This is the new birth. And when we're born again, He says, you're going to love. And it's imperishable. And, and, And growing in love and all that we're learning, it won't go away at the grave. It will live on forever and ever and ever. A gentle and quiet spirit. Gentle, the Greek word means meek. It means kind or caring. The beauty of a woman, meek and just kind. 
And quiet means peaceful, calm, in control. It's not a chicken little where the sky is always falling in. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Adornment with tranquility. It's almost like a picture of a still lake. Just the beauty of, of the tranquility. There's no, it's not full of anxiety and always fretting. It's not boisterous, just loud and dripping faucet. But it's a gentle and a quiet spirit. How powerful this instrument is in the hand of God. And how few will try it. I'll change the deadbeat. I'm going to nag him into the kingdom of God. I'm going to get him off that couch and start working if it kills me. The beauty of a godly woman, steady, deep, quiet, inner spirit, peaceful and trusting, not fretting and anxious. What this would do to an unsaved husband versus just focusing on the external and trying to control him by your body and by your beauty. And so my question is, how do we get that? There is so much stress to living with a control freak who hates God and his gospel. I don't think there could be anything more stressful. You try it, Pastor. I I know I would fail miserably. So how do you do it? And that's where I want to leave you this morning. I don't want to just leave you with a command. I want to give you power to live it. So if you'll look with me in verse 5. For in this way... In former times, the holy women also, who hoped in God, used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. See how far you've fallen, ladies? He used to call him Lord. (laughs) Highlight that. (laughs) And you have become... Her children, if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. And so do we have any models? Do we have any models to show us what this looks like? What's what's a model in our world? Oh, it's the magazines, the ads, the stores. We call them models. Models of what? Character, submission, gentle and quiet, excellent behavior, no mannequins. It's all on the outside. That's what's modeled. So Peter's going to say, I'm going to show you something that's beautiful on the inside. Here's your model. Here's your example, ladies, not Cosmopolitan and all those other magazines. It's in the Bible. In the Bible, we have some models of of true godliness, and in this church, we have them. And we have true femininity that God has designed that is beautiful. But there's a key in verse 5 that I think holds this whole section together. And he says, holy women who hoped in God... They were submissive to their husbands. And so the deepest root of womanhood, of godliness, is that you hope in God. You have been born again, and your hope is in the living God. My hope is not in that I'll get this job, my body will get better, I'll find the right husband, he'll get saved. My hope is in the living God. I've come by faith, and that is the very core of my being, and that's where all of this will flow from. If you don't have that, you can't go work on these traits. This is one who has put their hope in God, and and do you know what that means? Your hope is in God. It means that uh, I hope, my hope is that he will keep every promise that he made in this book. My hope is to, that, that you'll be what you said you would be to me, that to bring this world to its conclusion and to its end, that you're going to work everything for my good, that you're going to help me be a testimony to my unsaved husband. My hope is in God. That is where I've placed all of it. That's my primary hope. Do you remember that? This whole section began in 1 Peter 1.13, fixing your hope with finality on the coming to you grace of God. Hope in God. And so hear this. My hope is not in my husband. It isn't. My hope, young ladies, is not in getting a husband. That won't fix your main problem. My hope is not in a sweet Christian husband. My hope is in God, Christian women. My hope is not in my looks. My hope is in Jesus Christ. The Proverbs 31 woman, she looks at the future and does what? She smiles 
because her hope is in God. Whatever the future is, God will be there. And she, she smiles at it instead of shivers and quakes. My hope is in God. Godly women hoped in the sovereign God of the universe to help them. Holy women know their Bibles. Holy women hope in the God revealed in these Bibles. So beautiful. But what about a husband who abuses that? What about a husband who mistreats it? Well, what have we learned in this section? Jesus said he kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And that was that present tense. He just kept entrusting himself to Jesus while they're mistreating him and crucifying him instead of taking up his own agenda. I give that to God. I'm, I'm busy here saving the world. I'm giving that. I'm entrusting that to my Father who judges righteously. Mine is to do the work of salvation. The Father will judge them rightly. So wife, mine is to do the work of inner qualities that God uses to save men. And God will deal with a husband who abuses that. God himself will deal with that. And he will deal rightly with a husband who is mistreating a godly woman like this. You will get rewarded. And God says, this is precious in my sight. I love looking at a woman, God says, who's living this way in the midst of that unreasonableness. He will be dealt with by God for mistreating such beauty. Remember, submission is until they ask you to sin. And we've looked at that with the government, with bosses. It's the same thing with a husband. If they abuse you, we have laws and we have elders and a church to help. So let us shepherd you if that's the case. Come forward and, and let an elder help you. There are ways that we can help you in that. But this puts a woman in a very vulnerable place, doesn't it? And, and the, the emotion, I would say, is fear. Fear with a husband who's acting this way. And in verse 6, Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you've become her children if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. In the Greek, that says, fear nothing that is frightening. Fear nothing that is frightening. It's a frightening world. So many things could go wrong. Once you have children, you realize, boy, there's so many things that could happen to my house, our finances, my husband is unsaved, he's lazy. All these things can happen. I don't know about our future. I just don't know. My husband, he just, he scares me. Sarah's daughters are not afraid because they hope in God. Perfect love casts out all fear and trust yourself to him. I pray that many unsaved husbands would be brought to glorify God in the day of their visitation because of the excellent behavior of their wives. And I pray there's some of you in here right now that need that salvation. And I pray as you see the beauty of what the gospel really does in a heart by watching your wife, I pray right now that you would repent and believe in Christ and glorify God for that great, beautiful wife that God has given to you because of her chaste and respectful behavior. Not just her external beauty, but the beauty of a gentle and a quiet spirit that hopes in God. She's not afraid. And so in this passage, she has dependent meekness on God, and she has fearless courage in God. <laughs> Those don't usually go together in a woman. Usually it's um, brash or um, a pansy. I, I kept looking for a better word than that. I'm sorry. It just, it just hits a pansy where you, there's just nothing to you. There's no strength. You're just weak. You don't, that, that isn't what God's called a woman to be. And this is a call for a woman to have dependent meekness on God and a fearless courage. There's a strength to her that's beautiful. It's a fearless courage that I love in this passage. So by grace, this is a woman with a gentle and quiet spirit and fearless courage because she's hoping in the living God. I'm, I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid because I know in whom I have believed. And I trust and I hope in this God. And there's a courage, fearless courage 
to this woman. What a beautiful trait, quiet, gentle spirit, tranquility, and fearless courage. That's what the grace of God can produce in a woman. Beautiful. I'm going to close with just an example. This is a true story. I preached it back in Romans 12, but I'm going to bring it out again here because most of you weren't here when I preached Romans 12. <clears throat> true story. There's a man, and he, he's loose, and he lives a careless lifestyle, just a, a debauched life. And his wife gets saved. And as she gets saved and begins to manifest Christ in that home, uh, she bore his wrath and his ridicule. He was very aggressive against her faith, and he began mocking and ridiculing her, and she, she prayed for him. And the more she just kept praying for him, she said it, it seemed to only harden him. He just seemed to get worse. The kinder I was and the more I asked God to save her, it just seemed to be a hardening. Well, one night, this man was out with his friends just kind of boozing it up, and he begins boasting to all of them, going, I got the most submissive wife ever. He says, she'll do anything that I want. Anything I tell her to do, she'll do. And he says, I'll prove my point. It's like two in the morning. And he says, let's go home and we'll wake her up. We'll get, she'd been in bed for three hours. We'll wake her up and she'll just get up and make us all a meal. And so they go home and, and, and they're, they're like, all the men are going, there's no way. There's not a woman alive who would do that. And they're mocking. And they go back and he wakes her up. And the woman arose and she began to serve the drunken men, one of the finest feasts that they had ever had. And she did it with such cheerfulness. One of the drunkards was so touched by this woman. He said, I know you're a religious woman and you don't approve of what we do. How are you able to serve us the way that you did? And her answer, I and my husband were both formerly unconverted. But by the grace of God... I'm a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. I have daily prayed for my husband and have done all I can to bring my husband to a better mind, and I see no change. I fear that he's going to be lost forever, and I have made up my mind to do all I can to make him happy while he is here, because he'll know no happiness after the grave. After the men left, the husband said, do you really think I'm going to be unhappy forever. And she said, I, I fear so. Would to God that you would repent and seek forgiveness in Jesus Christ. And that night the man was converted and became what a husband should be. That's a beautiful, quiet, gentle spirit with courage and strength that hoped in God. So my closing thought is if you're here and you have blown this really, really bad, you're in a marriage like this and you've tried all of your own control, all of your own manipulations, you've just, you've just lived a life of being a dripping faucet to this husband. I want you to look at the cross. I want you to look at the cross truly and be forgiven. A full forgiveness because Jesus Christ died on that cross for the way that you've been treating your unbelieving husband. And I want you to repent and ask your husband's forgiveness even if you're scorned. And I want you to hope in God and get good ladies around you from this church and start living the command and what God has called you to here in 1 Peter 3. So there is a full forgiveness for you. And you don't have to say, I've blown it, I can never change it. It can start today. It can start today. And then secondly, if you're in that situation, I want you this morning to look at the cross. And that he says in it that you could die to sin and live to righteousness. He's saying that at the cross, I purchased for you now the ability to be like the women of old who hoped in God and did not fear, and they submitted to their husbands. There's a grace available to do what no human being can do and their own strength. And so I want you ladies, if you're in this, to come. And, and you, you need this even if you're living with a husband who's saved and difficult. And it's these same glorious, beautiful principles. And there is a way to live this way before him. And so there's many questions 
to work out. I had a boatload more, but I'm so far out of time. Uh, I, I had a bunch of questions, so go work them out in the body this week. Get in your community groups. Get into fellowships. Whatever you can do, start praying and talking and helping each other. We're, we're, a, we're a community. We're a team. We're a family. We're the body of Christ. Let's help each other. And those who know of wives in this situation, pray for them. It's so hard. Encourage them. Help them. Uh, model it to them. Let, let's just let's be a family. And then older ladies, teach these younger ladies what beauty really is. They, they have a world that's lying to them and telling them all the wrong things of what beauty really is. And so let, let's get in their lives and show them and tell them what true beauty really looks like. And Next week, husbands, man, put on your seatbelts. I am still bleeding from my study this week. You are in trouble, but it's beautiful. <laughs> it's, we we, we got to have what this next verse is going to call for. And so, I, you know, wives, you had to take the hard shots today, but you should love the Word of God and saying, I want to be like Christ. Love this. And then men, next week, let's come, let's want to change. Let's, let's deal with it. Let's quit hiding it and subduing it. Let's become these kind of men and women in our marriages and in our homes. So let's go to God and, and thank Him for this word. Father, I thank You for the shepherd's heart of Peter. God, as he's taken this congregation and shepherding and teaching them excellent things, how to live lives of excellence so that people would glorify You on the day of their visitation. And so, Lord, I, I pray uh, that You would raise up many women in this church who would have these inner qualities of a gentle and quiet spirit, that they would labor on the person of the heart, God, and that this godliness would shine and reflect in all areas of their lives, Lord, and that many would come to know Christ through them. I pray for those with unsaved husbands, Lord, what a heavy weight they carry to, to, to not be able to share the beauties of Christ with their one flesh relationship. God, uh, only they know the million battles they got to face on a daily basis. I pray this morning that you, they would not die under the weight of this word, but God, that they would be refreshed, that they would, would find uh, uh, repentance and, and time of refreshing with you. God, that they would have a new, a new uh, tools in their belt for how to go and live the way you want them in their home. So give them an amazing, abundant grace. Give them encouragement. Give them a body to love and care about what they're going through. God, let us help each other. This is one of the most difficult areas to live out our faith. Let us help. Let us be a family, and, and we cry for your help above all else. Lord, I thank you for this. I pray if there's any in our midst this morning who are gritting their teeth right now and they are so mad about this word submission, God, they're angry. And I want them right now to know they're not angry at me, but they're angry at the God who designed this. There's enmity in their heart that can only be removed at the cross of Jesus Christ. God, I pray this morning that they might find what is the source of this enmity, and that they would come and bow their knee to Jesus Christ and rejoice and receive the beauties of what you have for them. God, all of your ways are better than man's thinking. Let us submit to the will of God. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.